So it's an honor to introduce our next two speakers, Alpha Demolash and Alex Forrester, the founders of the Jersey City-based nonprofit Rising Tide Capital. They are both remarkable individuals and pioneers in the field of community-driven entrepreneurship and inclusive economics. If you've been following along with our monthly speaker series, Alpha might look familiar to you. This spring, during our May Schumacher conversation, Alpha shared how their organization launches community entrepreneurs by meeting them where they're at, through evening and weekend hours, guidance in languages other than English, and connections to forms of patient capital. When well-supported, she explains, these creative and determined individuals shape livelihoods for themselves and others while sparking renewed vitality in their places. By offering not merely information, but wisdom, and on not only services, but care, Rising Tide is unlocking human potential at community scale. Alpha is the CEO of Rising Tide Capital, originally hails from Ethiopia, and has dedicated her life to empowering underserved entrepreneurs. Around 90% of the entrepreneurs they help are, Latino or are black or Latino. Alex serves as the Chief Operating Officer of Rising Tide Capital, hails from New Jersey, it's like, mm -hmm. and recently completed a master's level research at Drew Theological Seminary on ecology, economics, and spirituality. Together, Alex and Alpha are recipients of the prestigious Heinz Award and have been recognized with Rising Tide Capital at the White House, United Nations, World Economic Forum, CNN Heroes, and elsewhere. Alex and Alpha's organization has been inspiring and guiding, guiding other nonprofits around the United States. The model has expanded and their award-winning programming is being replicated nationally, with Rising Tide now serving over 1,000 entrepreneurs each year in cities across the country. Lastly, one of the things that I think makes their partnership truly special is that they're not only professional collaborators, but married life partners and the parents of two boys, Noah and James, who are here with us today. <laughs> yes, you get a shout out as well. <laughs> Alex and Alpha's journey together began when they met freshman year of college and their shared commitment to the mission of Rising Tide Capital has remained steadfast over the past 19 years. This collaboration of two annual lecturers will be the first of its kind. Please welcome Alpha and Alex. Good evening, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it is such an honor to be here with you all. Uh, in this incredible community. We want to recognize the land that we stand on and all who have come before us uh, for thousands of years. We, uh, may we walk in their footsteps and learn how to steward this land and this place and all places in the same spirit. I first met Alpha Demolash nearly 25 years ago on a cool September afternoon in Boston. We ran into each other in a freshman year courtyard and began a conversation that has continued now, unbroken across all these years. A conversation that has in many ways come to define our lives. As Alpha tells it, she took pity on me. She saw me sitting all by myself, friendless in a new place, with a stack of books by my side. What are you reading? She asked me. What it was, I no longer recall. But I do remember what she said next. What good are all those books going to do, she said, in a world of suffering and violence, of genocide and war? I mumbled something in feeble protest, but she countered. She was skeptical of so-called philosophers and their armchair prognoses on the meaning of life. She had seen enough, she said, to convince her that what the world needed wasn't more words, but action. Action in the face of injustice, of oppression, of poverty and violence. This was a provocative point. In a world of so much suffering and injustice, what role do ideas play? We debated and debated, and over the years that followed, our points began to connect. We agreed that the desire for change is a powerful force in the world, but that people like Gandhi, Dr. King, and others 
didn't achieve what they did simply through the force of their actions alone. Rather, they also lifted up a set of ideas that drove their work, ideas that were powerful and compelling and mobilized millions of others to do the same. The work of organizations like the Schumacher Center and this community of change agents is very much in the vein of this tradition. We also agreed that it worked the other way around and that some of the deepest wounds in our world today emanate from old and destructive ideas and the hold they still have over how we understand our world, how we construct our identities and how they shape our imagination for what's possible. We had come to agree on this. History moves at the intersection of ideas and action. The most powerful way to pursue change is to engage the eclectic imagination of people, to lift up an alternative for the future, a story that can ground a different path, and then, most crucially, to prove it out by living the alternative and charting a path by which others can join along and pour their own lives into the effort. Inspired by this vision, in 2004, we started Rising Tide Capital together. We had come to the conclusion that the path of justice in our time, the journey to what Dr. King called the beloved community, required a necessary engagement with economics. And in particular, with the kind of economics that was focused not exclusively on profit, but more holistically, on people and planet as well. We wanted to explore the question of the kind of economy that would beat at the heart of the beloved community. And we believed that it had something crucial to do with investing local, in local communities and the creativity of the human spirit. On that note, I want to say thank you again for having us here. Thank you, John, for your remarks and for your relationship with Susan and the relationship between Susan and Bob that gave us this opportunity for all of us to be gathered. And thank you, Agatha, for your words of welcome as well. And of course, to all of you for taking the time on a rainy afternoon to be here for this annual lecture. And I also want to give a special shout out to my boys because they have been so caring and patient and so attentive to us as we've prepared. So on that note, I want to say this, what Alex has expressed, has been our guiding force over all these many years at Rising Tide Capital, and it is what brings us here today. The work of E.F. Schumacher and of the community of scholars, activists, and social entrepreneurs who have been influenced by him stands as a shining example for all who seek to reimagine our economics as part of a deeper engagement with our world. For decades now, we have read, listened to, and collaborated with others who are part of this community. Together, we have affirmed that the transformation of our world relies on seemingly small yet potent actions on the part of millions of community-based entrepreneurs and small business owners and leaders who are lifting up initiatives that translate into care for neighbor and for one another. For me, it gets even more localized than that. When I think of the idea that small is beautiful, I think of my mom. My mom left my country of birth, Ethiopia, due to communist dictatorship that was causing the deaths of millions of youth, including her older sister, my aunt. In doing so, she entrusted my care to her younger sister and my grandparents and hoped to reunite with me once she found her foothold in this new country. However, she soon realized that her wages as a waitress would not be sufficient to enable her to reunite with me, and so she started a business, designing and sewing gowns and in the process stitching together more than just the means to bring me here and reunite with me, but also a community of friends and those who can be counted on to help a neighbor in need. The thousands of entrepreneurs we work with at Rising Tide Capital every year now, so it's a thousand in New Jersey, but our 14 other partners in the other states are also working with their many hundreds. They, all that journey started with just 15 entrepreneurs in a community in Jersey City, which remind me of my mother's seemingly small but committed actions that transformed my life, and in so doing gave me the opportunity to participate in a much larger vision and story. 
I want to live in a world that recognizes these entrepreneurs for the courageous, creative leaders they are. One that facilitates equitable opportunities for them to succeed, not just for their sake, but for all of us. The power of this kind of entrepreneurship is not about creating unicorns and IPOs and wealth that is defined in purely financial terms. It's about the countless opportunities to solve everyday problems, regenerate the conditions that make for healthy, creative, connected lives, and extend the agency of individuals, families, and communities. It is what I have experienced with not just my mother, but so many others since. It is a pattern of relationality that is as old as humanity itself. In every single community in the world, regardless of wealth, race, gender, and ethnicity, or shared historical trauma, there are entrepreneurial people, many with the innate ability to lead and create new enterprises and initiatives, though they may not see themselves as leaders or call themselves as entrepreneurs. If we can build around these incredible grassroots leaders, if we can recognize the, their resilience and creativity, I believe we can create the conditions for beloved community in our time. And while this mission of entrepreneurship is deeply tied to issues of inclusion and equity, we must stress at the same time, it's not simply about inviting more people onto the sinking ship of the modern global economy. The logical contradiction that Schumacher points to about the madness of pursuing infinite growth in a finite world has reached a boiling point in our time. In fact, for many entrepreneurs at Rising Tide Capital, they are quiet observers of what they see as a global economy in need of deep correction. This global economy discounts the sacred value of relationships of care between people and community, and the need to steward land and nature with healthy respect and mutuality for the long term. Our generation, our generation, has the choice. If we are to survive as a species, we will need to transform human civilization as we know it. We will need to achieve at a collective level a new way of inhabiting our planetary home. We will need to accept the responsibility of living within its patterns of circularity and putting care into what we put into the air, water, and soil so we can support the entire web of life around us. What's more, we must consider the immense resources we have at our disposal to do so. Now is the time to deploy all that we have learned and achieved to return what we have extracted already from the planet, people and animals and the land, to repair and regenerate all that is depleted, including our sen sense of connection to one another and our resilience to bravely and courageously encounter much of what lies ahead. This is the vision of ecological civilization. And like Schumacher, we believe that local communities and local entrepreneurs are a huge part of what this will need to look like. But here's the problem. These two goals, beloved community and ecological civilization, these two goals cannot be thought of as separate things. We must move into a time in which the cause of justice and the cause of planetary ecology are seen as one in the same movement. We must see them as connected at the deepest level as a unified societal goal that we must aim on both sides to achieve. This is the reason why our message today is about the idea of beloved community as ecological civilization. It's an important message because we're too often presented with what amounts to a false choice. Policy issues are commonly framed as a conflict between ecological sustainability or economic justice for the poor and marginalized. Issues of social equity and racial justice are too often framed narrowly around winning in the global marketplace, while environmental regulations are critiqued for the economic pain that would be borne by people who can't afford it. As a result, the general public is often caught in political paralysis, and the social movements on both sides are left disconnected from each other. This has to change. Economics is at the very heart of these issues. And if we don't figure out how to develop a new economics, one that can integrate the cause of social justice with the cause of ecological sustainability, we will fail at both. 
And if we fail, we can expect the forces of social unrest and political violence to spiral out of control in the years ahead. It is for this reason that the quest for a new economics is a quest for peace. And we can probably look around us in the world today and feel very deeply why this is so urgent and alive. I have seen what it looks like to experience organized political and economic violence. I have been on the inside of the prisons in this country, and I have lost family members to the brutality of a communist dictatorship. I have traveled to Rwanda to study the 1994 genocide and mainly to explore what the comeback story looks like for humanity when we've burned everything to the ground. And I have witnessed firsthand the trauma and grief that flow from conflicts over what are perceived to be scarce resources and a competition for power and control amongst groups. I have also witnessed the tremendous beauty of small collaborative co-creation that spans across millennia, including in places like Marrakesh, standing in thousand-year-old medinas that are host to thousands of local entrepreneurs, creators, and makers, hosting many millions of outsiders every year. I have shared in the culture and music and joy of local entrepreneurs and communities right here in our own backyards as they sustain life and livelihoods with a sense of proportionality and the appropriate technology that Schumacher talks about. So we are not without examples of what is possible. And we are living in a new century, one that is in need of just such a new vision, a vision that has learned from all our old stories and traditions to give us a new story. We have new devices, innovations, that can be used for good or to bring more pain, extraction, and planetary suffering, if not stewarded with humility and an abiding concern for right relationship, with a fervent desire to repair broken relationships and trust between people, the lands that nourish and sustain us, and the institutions that shape the rules by which all of us play with each other. A new story with a new vision is needed to correct the excesses and missed opportunities so the wisdom of abundance and the generosity of the earth can be shared for seven generations to come and more. So what could the story be? How might we get to co-create it? So to lead out on this, Alex and I are going to cover two main sections. In the first half, we're going to talk about a set of core ideas that underlie this vision of a new economics that Schumacher so powerfully called for. We'll then share with you some of the opportunities we have to migrate from a vision of spiraling disconnection to that of shared flourishing. And then we'll close together by imagining the role we can play, all of us, in the story. For the past 20 years, Alpha and I have been pursuing together a journey guided by the vision of a different world. That a different world, a just world, is possible. The idealism of our youth has not faded over time but has rather intensified as the urgency of the stakes have become increasingly clear. A new economics is necessary and urgently so. But is a new economics even possible? The question is a fair one. The field of modern economics has worked hard to portray itself as one of the sciences in search of objective truths about the way the world works. Schumacher's critique begins here at this very point. Is economics truly a science? As a field of rigorous and methodological observation, yes. But the real issue is about the nature of science itself, for it's here that the error has occurred. The error has been in the myth of objectivity, the idea that science discovers objective truths about the world and does so by standing as a neutral observer of it. What we now know from science itself is that objectivity is strictly impossible. There is no such thing as a view from nowhere. Instead, we view the world from within, and everything we study contains a piece of us. The way we define our terms and design our tools or our experiments, these all shape the reality of what we observe, and they participate in the results they generate. In physics, this is called the observer effect. 
but we can also see it in our daily lives. The system of taxation in our country does not merely record and collect an appropriate share of revenue for the common good. It influences the behavior of those who are subject to its calculation. The way we define profit and what we allow or disallow has a huge impact on the structures that form. Our measurement systems are part of the world and the world reacts to them. This does not mean that nothing is true. All it means is that nothing is true in isolation. We participate in the creation of meaning itself and we have an immense existential responsibility over the kinds of things that we decide to make true in our world. Now, if we take this point seriously, that there's no such thing as objectivity, then what it means for economics is that it can no longer pretend to be simply a neutral observer discovering and revealing ways that the world works. Instead, it expresses a set of values. In this sense, Schumacher's point is that economics is not merely a science. Economics is an ethics. Schumacher is insistent on this point. Economics does not stand on its own feet, he writes. It does not abide in pure abstract theory. Rather, it derives its orientation from beyond itself, from the political and spiritual ideals of the people who wield it, who participate in it, and who derive value from it. And here is where things get really serious. Because what these values are has a huge implication. If we decide that economics is about profit, and that calculations of profit do not need to take account of our use of natural resources or the social consequences of our products, this is a moral decision. But this works the other way around as well. And this is why we can dream of a new economics. We have the ability to build our system of measurements based on our understanding of the world. And if we see negative consequences from our current system, we are entirely capable of revising it in order to better correspond to what we truly believe. Doing so, we can participate in creating the conditions that lead to repair and a new way forward, one that is in support of life and flourishing for all, including future generations, and not just for the lucky few. And this is precisely what Schumacher sets out to do. He begins by pointing to what he thinks is wrong about the current economic view, of the world and says that an entirely new system of thought is needed. In what follows, we want to lift up what he says is wrong and then continue the path he lays out in order to elucidate three core ideas that we might critique and revise about our understanding of the world as a contribution to what we might consider the conceptual foundations for a new economics. In Small is Beautiful, Schumacher forcefully argues against the underlying worldview that has come to shape the modern field of economics. It is a worldview that has ceded all value to the transactional functioning of a financial system, whereby all meaning is reduced to the accumulation of money and assets, regardless of human and ecological costs. An absence of purpose outside of self-regard and preservation, where money just fills the gap. We have become confused, Schumacher writes. Our reason has become beclouded by an extraordinary, blind, and unreasonable set of beliefs about the world. The common theme of these ideas, in his view, is their negation and reduction of the world, an interpretation of physics and biology that reduces the universe to blind mechanics. And what do we get from it today, he asks a view of the world as a wasteland in which there is no meaning or purpose, in which man's consciousness is an unfortunate cosmic accident, in which anger and despair are the only final realities. This reduction of the universe to meaninglessness, to deterministic forces, to accident without significance, is in Schumacher's view an absurd position. We don't really believe it, he says. Our head and our heart are in conflict, in conflict. But it exerts an influence on us nonetheless, and we find it difficult to articulate an alternative. For Schumacher, even his fellow economists are stuck. In fact, he writes, many of the economists are themselves unaware of the fact that such a view is implicit in their teaching, and that nearly all their theories would have to change if that view changed. And change they must. 
because these unexamined ideas have brought modern civilization to the edge of a precipice. We have cultivated a system we can best understand as an economics of nihilism, one that does violence to the earth and disregards the value of life itself. The depth of Schumacher's point that is that small is beautiful, therefore, can be seen as a protest against a view of the world that reduces it to meaninglessness. He makes the bold claim that a different philosophy of economics is required, one that would not negate the world in pursuit of profit, but rather would see the cultivation of life's true beauty as its core purpose. For me, reading these words is a powerful reminder about just how deeply consequential our ideas are in shaping the world we live in. They influence our actions in innumerable ways. If we conclude that the world is meaningless, that beauty itself is an illusion, then this is going to express itself in the kind of life we live and the kind of world we have. As an economist, however, Schumacher's, Schumacher's focus was not on the ideas that would replace these false conceptions. He was focused on action, my kind of guy. He turns his attention to technology and to the ways in which we might pursue a different path, one oriented towards the gentle, the nonviolent, the elegant, and beautiful. This brings him into the exciting world of new economics that is such a deep inspiration to all of us here. Land trusts, alternative currency systems, cooperative business structures, local economics. These are the kinds of tools and systems that a new economics could be built upon. And it is precisely what has motivated our work at Rising Tide Capital over all of these years. We will return to this to what it looks like to invest in the efforts of people to live and work together differently in the collective effort of building a better world. We have seen precisely this hope come to bloom over the past 20 years. But let us follow for a moment this path that Schumacher prepared for us in his questioning of the metaphysical foundations of a new economics. For we cannot actually depart from the old system until we can truly lift up an alternative set of ideas. As Schumacher correctly pointed out, these ideas have a hold over our imagination in ways that we, ad we don't adequately realize. This is one, it's one thing to point to them in protest, but we need to continue this path and think with Schumacher and with all of you about what we might put in their place. To that end, there are three main points we want to lift up. First, we look at smallness and ask, what is it that makes it beautiful? Then we look at a crucial objection that comes up in relating to a fear over scarcity. And finally, we will point to the false view of competition as the main driver of evolution and of the world we inhabit. Small is beautiful, Schumacher proclaims. But what does it mean to be small? In a world of threats and dangers, to be small is often perceived as vulnerability and weakness. As children, we know this fear, the fear of the unknown forces that move in the wild, energetic world around us. But it's not only as children. In our adult lives, we see the risks and the dangers that come from navigating lands inhabited by giants. Often one of the very first issues we face with entrepreneurs at Rising Tide Capital is precisely this fear, this intimidation that comes from being small in a world that, where all the advantages seem to accrue to those with size on their side. In response, the natural desire is to be big and strong, to be invincible, to be untouchable. This issue of untouchability gets to the heart of the problem, however, for there's a cost that comes from pursuing size. We live in a world of relationships. Relationships nourish, nourish and nurture us. They are the joy of life and the source of much of what gives us meaning. And the bigger we get, the harder it is to stay in the closeness and proximity with this source. Perhaps you have experienced this in your own life or business. At Rising Tide Capital, it's been 
remarkable and challenging to navigate what it means to have two employees versus 40, or to begin with operations in just one neighborhood and to expand into 15 states. The danger of losing the vital connections, the soul that animates an enterprise is very real. And this is just as true for all endeavors, whether they be companies or countries. Now these risks and trade-offs can be mitigated in various ways, but it's the underlying navigational orientation that matters. If our fear over our vulnerability has us seek untouchability, then this strikes at the very root of life because it's relationship itself that becomes the victim. The precondition for relationship is precisely this ability to be touched. If we aspire to be so large that we can't be touched, what we're really doing is extracting ourselves from relationship itself. We must have skin, not only in a physical sense, but in the sense of our finitude. To be small in this sense is to embrace our finitude, to see our exposure and our vulnerability not as a threat to be eliminated, but as the opportunity for relationships of mutuality, support, and love. An economics of finitude is an inherently ecological ethics, one that seeks to make room for others and to see our mutual becoming as the true ideal around which to orient our efforts. To say that small is beautiful, therefore, is to say that finitude is beautiful. And this truly is a radical beginning for the new metaphysics Schumacher called for. The old metaphysics worshipped size because what it really worshipped was power. We must abandon this ideal. And we must abandon the destructive politics and the spiritualities of transcendence that often come with it. To be small, to be finite, is to inhabit the world in the mode of humility and hospitality. This is not a shrinking away. It is courage itself. Nor is it to abandon infinity, but rather to see that infinity is found in the embrace of another. The examples of collaboration and cooperation between business owners at Rising Tide, of the bakers who cooperate with the graphic designers and the event planners and the kitchen, operators, not just in the running of their own businesses and the sharing of customers, but also in the way that go beyond their businesses, in their communities, in support of local fundraisers for the youth recreation leagues or after school programs. These examples go on in every community every day. They mirror exactly the kind of cooperation that goes on in nature itself. But it's entirely invisible to our economic system as we currently have it, which tells all of these businesses to grow or die, to eat or be eaten. This is simply not the world we have to live in. Whew. Now this affirmation of finitude that is so powerful about Schumacher's philosophy leads us straight into an objection that we must overcome. And this brings us to the second idea we want to lift up. The objection has to do with a view of the world that equates finitude with a fundamental state of scarcity. It doesn't see finitude as beautiful, but rather as a negative thing that must be overcome. It seeks to hoard and dominate with the idea that a finite resource is always scarce and therefore ever more valuable, and that having more of it is always better. This is the equivalent of overeating in anticipation of a famine. We fear that there won't be enough, not enough time or money or customers. We believe that a finite world means there isn't enough land or water or energy. And this fear of scarcity exacerbates our feeling that what we need to do is to become as big as possible in order to grab what we can and protect what we have. There is no more important conceptual driver of modern economic thought than this issue of scarcity. Finitude is not the same thing as scarcity. In fact, I think John modeled it for us in saying, maybe my time is coming and so I will compost what I have so that a new thought could emerge and others could be inspired. It is a categorical error to equate them, 
but it is precisely this assumption that prowls beneath our economic view of the world. And here again, as with the vulnerability of smallness, the problem that comes is when we negate something positive in order to avoid a negative. If we embrace our finitude, we can come to a mindset oriented around collaboration and problem solving. But the fear that lurks that no matter how much collaboration we engage in, there simply won't be enough for all causes people to engage aggressively with the world in a proactive attempt to defend against the actions of others. For small business owners at Rising Tide Capital, we see this at work in the classroom when people find themselves in the same room as others in their community who are thinking of starting the same kind of business as them. At first, people clam up. They don't want to share their product ideas, their marketing plans, their pricing strategies. This is understandable from a psychological perspective, but it's an unnecessary move. When we remember that we are small, that the world is so much larger than us, that as business owners, the size of the market and the dynamism of how it can be creatively engaged with is a completely blank canvas. This can open us back up to what is possible if we collaborate. The needs of one may be the strengths of another. The limitations that are built into our finitude are precisely the opportunities to come into collaborative relationship with others in pursuit of a larger vision. When our entrepreneurs realize this, it's like the light switches on. Questions and ideas start flying around and the fabric of community itself is woven just a little bit tighter. What this shows us is that while we must navigate the ways in which scarcity does occur in our world, it does not do so because the world is finite, but because of dynamics that we have the ability to influence and organize around. So if the first idea we lifted was that finitude is beautiful, then the second must be this. There is no crisis of scarcity built into the fabric of reality. Amidst the astounding plenitude of the universe, the pale blue dot of our planetary life is bathed in an overwhelming abundance of energy, more than we could ever need. In fact, more energy falls on the surface of our planet every hour than all of humanity uses in an entire year. An entire civilization could be built around the cultivation of our planetary abundance, an entire economy as well. The radical economics of someone like George Bataille, who writes about this very subject in his three-volume study of the Accursed Share, points directly towards this issue of the flow of abundance and the need to organize not simply around storing up, but also about how we let abundance flow through and out into the rest of the world, including into the hands of our neighbors. But this way of navigating is not possible if we remain trapped in the false ideology that we live in a world of scarce resources and that we must fight tooth and nail to keep every scrap we can before our neighbor takes it away. And precisely this issue this image of fighting tooth and nail with our neighbor is what brings us to our third and final concept. We have lived for too long under an interpretation of evolution as a state of universal competition. But let us recognize that this has merely been a projection. A closer look at our natural world reveals layers upon layers of mutuality and cooperation among species. The animal and plant world of which we are a part is overflowing with these examples. We tend to see nature red in tooth and claw, but this is a lens that clouds our eyes to a much larger story that's going on. At the heart of nature is a deep system of collaboration, and evolution itself is driven by these collaborative structures. In fact, the birth of complex life itself has been shown to occur as primordial act of what Lynn Margulis has called symbiogenesis, which means literally becoming by living together. We must shed the false view of the world as a universal war of each against all and embrace instead with contemporary science what contemporary science has revealed. Collaboration, not competition, is the true engine of evolution. 
In his classic text, I and Thou, Martin Buber captures this idea for the ages. He writes, I require a you to become. Becoming I, I say you. All life is encounter. Let us use this quote to bring these three reflections together. These ideas represent a very different set of assumptions about our world and our part in it. If the world is not driven by deterministic forces of atoms in a void, but is rather a vibrant dance of relational encounter, if the evolution of life is not fundamentally a competition over scarce resources, but rather a collaborative enterprise of creative response, then we have a very different basis upon which to build our world. The concept of collaboration must be our starting point. And so we come to our next session with a crucial question about how to move forward with these ideas, how to translate them into positive action in the world, in the context of our mutuality. If we know that human civilization has approached a moment of crisis in which we must collaborate together to find a new way, then the question that faces us is, what kind of partnerships will this evolution require? What types of social patterns will facilitate the transformation we need? We believe, like many people in this community, that the only way we will make it is if we can find our way to a new vision, a new story for humanity. We need a story that can guide our imagination and help us find ourselves and our purpose in the larger narrative. Alpha, I know we've been talking about just such a story for a number of years now. It's a story you've been calling the greatest migration. Can you help us navigate? Is there hope? Yes, the good news is that there is indeed always hope. I believe that, and I think that is the core definition of hope. And I'm leaping into a state of faith, faithfulness by actually practicing what we preach, vulnerability, which is to engage all of you live in our process of reimagining this new story. So a way for us to think together. I ask for your mercy and forgiveness in advance for any technological failures. <laughs> um, we can always blame the technology. But yes, so this is a story that begins to try and map a way out of what we have been talking about, this world of scarcity and, and economics that's predicated on one thought, which is that all of us need economic security, first and foremost, and that so many groups are, and individuals and families are focused on this need for economic security. It is the dominant driver of our desires. And yet, on another axis here, we also have a growing sense and desire and hunger for meaning and purpose and freedom and dignity and all of these that would be encompassed in a word like actualization. It's not my favorite, but it is what we have to work with for now. So this is another, um, another driver that we're seeing people, certainly in the world of work, who are quitting their jobs, particularly in light of the pandemic, who are saying, I really, I can't just show up for the sake of advancing my economic security. I need purpose in my life. I need meaning and connectivity. So this two by two frame presents kind of the dominant uh, paradigm. And part of the work that we're attempting to do in thinking together is to say, surely there is another way to arrive at what we would call true security or safety that we still need shelter, that we still need food, we still need a way to protect and nourish our young, and that it may not be perhaps the same thing as economic security. That in fact, that true security is nourished and supported by something that is very much predicated on relationships and relationality, and our local communities and our local economies and ways in which we protect one another. So this is the paradigm shift. And what I will start with is by naming these as lands. And even though this is a two by two 
please try to exercise your imagination with me because the world is not flat. I have good news. <laughs> it is multidimensional. So here in the bottom left corner here, we have what we would call the land of abandonment. Really, so many people amongst us and in the many communities that both Alex and I have worked in and many, many of you know about, there's a sense of being abandoned by big corporations, by government, really, the system is rigged, we hear. All kinds of ways in which people experience economic predation and a sense that there really isn't a way for them to make their way towards any sense of security, even the economic security one, even when they're working two or three jobs. So many, even in New Jersey, 40% of those who are in the labor force find themselves working multiple jobs and yet not able to make their basic uh, economic needs met. And so if we call that the land of abandonment, as you've heard a little bit from our story, Alex and I have found ourselves amongst many who are brave, who are courageous, who are migrating towards what we would call the land of purpose. They don't necessarily have any promises of economic security, but they have ideas, and like my mom, they start initiatives and businesses. And what we can do is meet them to help them migrate as they're making their way into what we would call the land of purpose. And on the land of pur in the land of purpose, we'll call these rivers, rivers of resilience. And these entrepreneurs and local leaders are creating goods and services with purpose lanterns at their center and migrating on these rivers towards greater and greater, not only economic security, but really a shared sense of connectivity, community, and actualization. Now, obviously, those who are in the land of abandonment, I would posit, and we've experienced, don't need any more pressure. There's a lot of pressure there, and what they're looking for is for hope. Rivers of hope that things can change, that companies can be created where they can bring their capabilities, their talents, their passions, and contribute, and have seats at a table, be able to support something that could actually help them actualize while enabling them to provide for their families. Now, we also have many brothers and sisters who are here in what we would call the land of disconnection. Here, capital is not the problem. Economic security is not the issue. They have a lot of economic security, and yet they too feel disconnected, disconnected from a sense of purpose and meaning and connection to what makes life worth living. And so they too need a river. In fact, let's give them more rivers because what's in the land of disconnection is not purely just individuals, but it's also powerful institutions and investments that need to migrate. And for the institutions, a lot of the rivers that speak to them have to do with innovation. Their existential fear about whether or not they can continue to grow and grow and grow and have more and more customers and relevance, innovate or die, is something that is ingrained in the identity of many entities and so innovation calls to them to, to begin to change, to begin to adapt, to begin to listen to their consumers and stakeholders, all their stakeholders. For individuals, rivers of legacy are really important. We see all the gifting that is happening and people who are saying, I have grandchildren now and I don't want the world to actually come to the kind of end when I could do something about it. And so legacy is an important pool. And there's also belonging. 
for the millions who are stranded in corporate structures that don't support their full actualization and well-being, they too are seeking ways of connection and belonging. And so this migration across all the lands and from all the rivers has already begun. And we'll call this migration to the land of flourishing and really the opportunity it presents germane to our topic of economics today as the opportunity to create the beloved economy. An economy that is not predicated on fear. Where did it go, Alex? Has it disappeared? Ah, oh, there it is. The reverse. Mm. <laughs> uh, the beloved economy is shorthand for this economy that must come to fruition, powered not on the basis of measurements of growth, on metrics that make no sense to even my children who are not yet even in middle school. And so the key is to recognize that on the other side of what we anticipate as being what happens when the land of abandonment continues to grow unabated, when people are frustrated, when there is no way to move for the individual or for communities between structures of power and rules that have been overlaid that really constrain their ability to have any sense of agency. When that happens, we have social collapse and revolutions. But the choice and the dynamism of what we have in front of us as a generation that is hyper communicative and has had so much access to information and history and stories is that when revolutions usually happen, the game just resets. And it's just about who else is in power and who else is hoarding and who else is dominating. But we have an opportunity to choose a different way a different way to build our economics based on relationality, based on the finitude and beauty of smallness. Because there will always be an economy on the other side of whatever comes. The choice is, is it gonna be an economy powered by fear and scarcity? That is the true border wall that is preventing us now. The fear that people who are in the land of disconnection have about falling into the land of abandonment, should they change any of their behaviors or start measuring things differently. And here we are confronted and some of our greatest leaders who have brought us out of the darkest of our histories say it's possible to build on love. Love is an abundant resource. It is a privilege that shocks all the other privileges out of water. I know we talk so much about white privilege, but we know that is a constraint on our imagination. Love privilege is the abundant resource that we must be turning to, to create the kind of collaborative relationships at every level proportionally that could bring us and emerge an economy that is very much possible and was in view. So this journey across all these rivers, and it is not to say that there is a destination like a land, like the land of flourishing where everything stops. Everything continues to flow in circularity there, except this, what we're calling the greatest migration, is rooted in something that touches not just our material ability to move things around, but our mindsets, our hearts, our consciousness itself. That, of course, the I, the individual, each of us are important, are infinitely valuable. Whomsoever saves one life saves the world entire. It is a truth. And yet, the eyes don't just live on islands. We did not just show up here by some flash in the pan situation. We have emerged 
out of a we. We have emerged out of a consequential we, one full of tensions, but yet shapes our I. And this new consciousness that must arise in us is that it's not enough to just be in consideration of ourselves as individuals and the we out of we emerge or the we of the family that we must protect or the we that we uh, are in community with. It's a consciousness that says all the we's, they are us. And that when we're truly in the land of flourishing, the way we build, the way we act, our principles, what we sacrifice is predicated on an understanding of our interdependence and that our circles of concern must be wider to include our capacity to love those who are very far away from us, whether it be geographically or in ideology, even when it is so hard to love them. And so this is part of the circularity that must also be nourished by our faiths, by our actions for sure. And when we're migrating out of these lands, it is the great migration and one we're daring and willing to say is the greatest one. Because time requires us to act with agility now because we know some things about our planet and what it requires of us. We know some things, a lot of things about us and how we behave when we're operating out of fear and scarcity. And each of us have the opportunity to participate in this greatest migration in what we do every day and what we do when we're together in community like this. So that is a vision of the beloved economy in the greatest migration. Alpha, can I just say what a deep joy it is to be on this journey with you. You are so brilliant and loving and bold. Um, thank you for sharing that with us today. Let's draw these reflections to a close. It would be too easy to simply say that all we have to do is change our perspective and everything will be fixed. We all know that is not enough. There's a step we all must take. And it is a true leap of faith. It's a leap because there is no idea or framework powerful enough to prove to us this one thing that the world is beautiful, that it has meaning and purpose, that people are good, and that we can ultimately come to live in a world of peace and justice together. This is a choice. Once we make this choice, our way of moving in the world necessarily changes. Our fear does not guide our actions. And this changes the reality that others experience too. Each and every one of us lives a life of importance to the world. What we do matters. It is material. It has consequences. And so as we head out from here, as we consider our future and how to face it, the personal agency that each of us has in this journey is significant. But the journey is not an individual one. It is a collective one. The, the rivers. They must converge together in order to make it across into the land of flourishing. The purpose lanterns we light and all of those terrapins journeying along. They require us. They each require many to join. We need each other, not just emotionally, but materially. We work together. We create together. This collaboration is at the very root of our life, our society, our economy. This talk itself has been a collaboration. As families, 
in communities, as businesses and associations, as agencies and corporations, as investors and institutions, we are fundamentally united into structures of collaboration. Our economics works by the same dynamics of life itself as a poetics of collaborative endeavor. This is the true engine of evolution and it is the heart of the beloved community. Together, we can make this change. We can take the leap and launch the journey. When we see obstacles in our way, when we encounter others whose boats have taken on water or are grounded, there are very material ways we can come to each other's aid, and doing so will not mean less for us. Collaborative endeavor always results in a higher capacity for the future. By engaging it with others in this way, we're able to make the change we need. We will make it to this destination, this beloved community as ecological civilization. Mm -hmm. Dr. King spoke powerfully of the long arc of the universe that bends towards justice. And his dream was not merely a dream. This is in our nature. It is our nature. But the bending requires effort. It requires that we take the leap. So let us set our purpose lanterns alight. Mm -hmm. Find the terrapins that are operating in your community that you could support or join. Start something new. Use your influence to bring the rivers together wherever possible. It is entirely possible to do this. Over 20 years of work, we have seen it happening at Rising Tide Capital in our community and beyond, and it gives us immense hope you are invited to join this movement and be part of this story, the story of the greatest migration. Beloved community as ecological civilization, may it be. May we make it happen for our time and the generations to come. Thank you. That was really beautiful and really well done. You seem to be a great couple. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious if you consider yourselves to be in the quadrant of flourishing, and if so, per what personally got you to be there? Ah, well, he might have a different answer, but I would say um, yes in large part because um, everything that we have done, so we started Rising Tide Capital straight out of college. We were not trained in trained economists or in business or anything. We were actually more uh, grounded in relationship and talking to people in community and saying, oh, they never taught us how to balance our checkbooks either. Let's go find out what that's all about, you know? And just through a series of relationships the work of Rising Tide has emerged, and uh, the people, including our parents who are here, who made it possible, who collaborated with us, who uh, gave us the freedom to keep pushing and encouraged us and fed us and gave us their couch, and, uh, and so many who've done that. Everything in our lives that has been made possible, including our presence now, and uh, we live in Philmont and send our children to Hawthorne Valley was a result of a relationship with the Pings and Martin Ping is here. Um, all has been made possible for ourselves. We've been provided for through an extraordinary array of relationships. So it's small decisions that individuals have made to be in relationship with us, to connect with us, and to be in, uh, in it for the long term. And it has created immense beauty beyond my imagining. So I have no other explanation for it as the land of flourishing. Do you want to add or do you agree? Uh, I think, I mean, I, I've really enjoyed um, engaging with Alpha in this, uh, this visual story. And, and there's a lot of depth there. I mean, you could really have an entire dinner conversation unpacking different layers. And we've talked a lot about, okay, well, is it a journey? Is it a... Is it a linear path? Uh, do each of us actually start in one of those quadrants and then move? Um, and I, I tend to lean uh, towards the idea 
that uh, that there are parts of us in all four quadrants, and that there are things that happen in life that actually shift our center of gravity towards one or the other, um, and that in some ways the idea to be able to go uh, to the land of flourishing is almost like turning a two-dimensional piece of paper into a sphere, that there is almost like a raising up that uh, doesn't leave behind um, these other lands, but actually redeems them all and brings them together into this larger story. And so in, in some sense, the land of flourishing mm -hmm. is about a redemption of the land and a redemption of the entire journey that brings it all together, um, fueled by love. So, um, but these are the kinds of, you know, it's a dinner conversation that can just go on. <laughs> That's great. Um, and then talking about your different relationships, um, this is a question from the audience. Um, in, from all the entrepreneurs you've met, what supports do community entrepreneurs need to be able to create beautiful businesses that serve people on the planet? So from um, our earliest days, our question has been guided by that concern. You know, what do they need where they are? What does it look like to meet them where they are? And initially we thought it was money. And we set it up as a fund and called it Rising Tide Capital and started calling up anybody who has money and created a fund and said, it's money. They need capital, working capital. They need to be able to uh, not be bound up in, um, in the kind of debt relationships that really bind up their ability to actually create that thing. And, and so, but within two years, we'd realized that we actually need many different forms of capital and that what they needed was also people to come alongside them. They needed what we ended up calling social capital. Uh, they needed connections and access uh, across class, across neighborhoods and industries. <laughs> they needed somebody to open the door. Um, they also needed um, the kind of knowledge capital that would help them as they evolve their businesses, as they change their mind, as they realize maybe that thing that they were trying to do to make that beautiful business didn't work. And so ultimately what became the core of Rising Tide was to focus on what we call the Community Business Academy. Right now there are 40 Community Business Academies that are running simultaneously just this week across the country with cohorts of local entrepreneurs uh, across many different industry sectors. And they are playing games together. The average age of our entrepreneur is 40. And they are, um, over 50% of them don't have any access to college education. Um, so they are learning by doing and they're working on the tensions and, uh, and then the, the knowledge capital that that forms is not something that goes away just because they decided that baking was not for them anymore, that they wanted to actually explore something else or get into education. And, and so by creating the social capital, creating the knowledge capital, as well as access to the kind of financial capital that can meet them at different stages of their journey um, and helps them make choices and decisions about whether they wanna be in debt or maybe not. Maybe they want to bootstrap it, <laughs> or maybe they, uh, they need much larger forms of capital, um, which is so often tied to social capital. So there is a need for integrated capital, and it falls on the social and the material. Um, another audience question is, what things do you think we, we should measure that we are not? I'm assuming it's about the economy. I'll let you interpret it as you You'll assume it's about the what? The economy, you know, GDP, <laughs> instead of measuring it that way, what else should we aim towards? That's such a great question. I, I serve as the chief operations officer. Um, when Alf and I started Rising Tide Capital together, it was really a little bit of a flip of a coin about what our roles would be at the organization. And um, we started it six months after we graduated uh, from college, and so we didn't really know anything about ourselves or what our gifts were in the world. Um, and as a postmodern philosophy and theology major, um, 
the connection between that and being a COO uh, only became clear to me later on that it was about really architecture, conceptual architecture. If you can link together a series of ideas and make meaning out of them, you can do that with numbers. You can do that with programs. You can do that in network structures. You can do IT. You, it's, it is, it's about architecture. And so um, measurement and our information architecture of how we track the progress of our businesses, we do uh, longitudinally study. Okay, what is the impact of, of starting these businesses? Uh, how do the businesses grow? Uh, how does the revenue grow? How many jobs are created? How does that impact uh, the income of the entrepreneur over time? Um, and so measurement has been something very, very uh, important uh, to us. And there is something that for us, there's, it's, there's an important humility about measurement that we just always keep in mind that it's just a tool, that it's not the reality itself, that the map is not the territory as the quote goes. Um, but I think that my answer to this question about what should we measure that we don't yet, um, it, gets to, it gets to these questions of externalities. And we think of uh, externalities uh, when we talk about economics um, and we need to be talking about externalities more and more because it really is about setting up systems of measurement to figure out how do we how do we internalize externalities into our economics, into our politics, into our businesses? And it's entirely within our control to do it. Um, I would say at Rising Tide, one of the things that we really deeply believe in is that it's not really about businesses, even though our entire organization is structured around helping people start and grow businesses. It is the means. It's not the destination. Businesses come and go. What we believe is happening at the deepest level and the longest term contribution that we're trying to make is uh, at the level of community, at the level of social capital, at a multi-generational impact uh, that occurs uh, when uh, a, a child grows up in a family, not only that isn't experiencing financial insecurity, but that also sees the agency and efficacy that's possible in the world through applied creativity. Uh, these are all things that are actually happening in the world. And I think that, in, it, that it's difficult for the world to figure out how do we measure social capital formation? How do we measure resilience? I think the, the crisis that we've all gone through in recent years with COVID made the strongest possible argument for the economic value of resilience that I could possibly imagine but how, but the system can't work until we find a way to quantify it so that it can use it. And as long as we don't forget that it's just a tool we're using, it's okay. Um, and I, I guess the, the final thing that I would lift up is that there is a, uh, there is a measurement of, um, of hope and of inspiration. Uh, I don't know the right word for it. People are, out there looking, and I know people in this extended Schumacher community have, have critiqued GDP and, and these measures, and how do we come up with measures that actually uh, enable us to test and pursue pathways that can create an economy that produces more flourishing. These are the things that we need to, to tackle, and it will require a coming together of these very different ways of thinking in collaborative structures and endeavors. Yeah, Dad, I, may I just add just one quick thing because the measurement issue is so huge for us right now and I just got back from a major massive uh, conference on sustainability that had all of the world's largest companies in it and whew, uh, and that one was interesting because right now there is actually legislation in play to um, bring similar to audit level measurement for ESG, environmental, social governance. And a lot of the conversation, I mean, all the major audit firms were there, as you can imagine, and the warning signs that were blaring to say, now you will be required to measure you know, uh, your impact in these arenas. 
and the the lesson learned from at least the room that I was in the rooms I was in conversation with um, did not strike me as as hopeful <laughs> because it seemed to indicate that all of those measures would be pushed uh, to those who are the, you know the suppliers and the vendors to these large uh, companies and that they would bear the brunt of needing to provide data in all of its microest forms as a way of being able to have the opportunity to do business or partner with these much larger entities. And so the burden is on these s smaller suppliers and vendors, but not really any of the benefits. Um, and the benefits are more about protecting the larger entity from the threat of audit. And the beneficiaries are the large audit companies who all of a sudden see massive opportunities to then create all kinds of controllers and auditors who will pursue this social data with an iron fist. And I just think that there is something r wrong, again, about how we're approaching uh, a world and what data is for and what measurement is for um, that doesn't center human well-being or relationships or the planet. So. So some new forms of measurement are good, but think about all the levels of people it's affecting and for what to what end. Okay. This other question is, how does one maintain the values of smallness while growing the tools and solutions to reach the large scale required to address global problems such as climate catastrophe? Um. Brian Stevenson uh, has talked about proximity as the measure of justice. That proximity is the fundamental uh, ingredient that is required if we are going to pursue justice and if we are going to end up in a, an end state of it. And so proximity comes to mind for us because um, it is about intimacy and affection at the end of the day. It is about the, the beauty of life is in relationships of intimacy. Now, intimacy can mean lots of things and it doesn't necessarily only mean time and space. It is about uh, threads of connectivity and it's about mutuality. Um, the reason I, I bring these up is because there is very clearly, and, and we are living, I mean, there is so much, as we, we struck a lot of gloom and doom parts out of our talk, but there's a lot of gloom and doom out there that we could have spent a lot of time pointing to. Um, but we also live in a time of immense capabilities. Uh, in many ways, even the, 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 the pandemic that we went through forced us as a planet to coordinate action using muscles that we had just never actually been asked to use before at that level of scale. And those are muscles that we are going to need to have to use again in order to confront the very significant changes that we will have to navigate uh, together. The fractal pattern capabilities of nature, where a pattern that works at a local scale can be replicated in other localities and have resonance at higher orders and higher levels of structures is, I think, the way that we should think about these kinds of things. And just to kind of make it practical, Rising Tide Capital is a good example. Um, we were headquartered in Jersey City. We've been working uh, and are headquartered on the same block, or on the same street that we have been for now 20 years. And at the same time, our organization is now uh, working and the model is now up and running in 15 states and we're growing by another three or four states every year. But the way that we chose to pursue this growth was driven by two main things. Number one, we knew that uh, the opportunity is huge and the need is huge. And if we were to simply just pursue a path of growth and expansion and try to make it to as many cities as we can, maybe we could do a whole bunch of stuff. 
but it would pale in comparison to the actual need and the time that would be the urgency of the time that we need to pursue these things. And so uh, our path of replication and scale was not to do it ourselves, not to get in helicopters and fly over and land and say, okay, this is how we do it, everybody. We packaged our model, uh, not just the curriculum of the Community Business Academy, but also all the systems, uh, the databases, the forms, the templates, the budgets, the job descriptions. It's all packaged. And then we took our name off of it, and we've lifted it up as a private label social franchise of a sort that other nonprofit organizations and groups in other communities around the country and around the world can use to hit the ground running 10 years ahead of where we had to start. They don't have to recreate anything. They also don't have to call it Rising Tide Capital. They can take this, they can adapt it to their community, and they can hit the ground running. And by, because we all have a shared infrastructure on the back end, we can learn from each other and as different communities end up developing new modules, new applications, new ways of doing things, we have enough commonality to actually be able to plug and play these different innovations back into the work we do and all the way across the network. We believe that this is the model for social change and scaling social change that uh, is built on the capabilities we have for the 21st century, uh, that uh, replicates the way nature does it, and that is the way that we need to be pursuing some of the very, very large scale changes that we need, but without falling into the temptation that a centralized approach um, is the only way to actually make things change at scale. And if I may add just one more thing, which is in the face of like what has happened in places like Morocco and Maui, um, I don't know if you've like noticed, but they have not wanted large scale interventions and people flying in because part of what happens with large scale interventions is that a, a lot of that intervention is actually doesn't have the good of the community in mind. It is just seen as an asset to grab. So if Maui's under fire and all these people don't have the means, everything has been burned to the ground. Uh, it's very easy to go in and offer them very little money that looks like a lot of money for them in the time of need and grab up all of their land and dislocate them. And so local communities are actually increasingly suspicious of any kind of large scale interventions that's coming from the outside and you know dangling carrots and, but um, so I think part of this is as we look at a world that has increasing uh, natural disasters and ecological crises, the ability to have trust and relationships so that people can actually get the help they need to get back on their feet to rebuild without facing this at scale solution that is saying you might have to give up things that are necessary for your future livelihood. Um, so a lot of communities around the world are getting very suspicious and very little trust in uh, organized at scale solutions. Yeah, that reminds me of the documentary Poverty Inc. Mm. You've seen that? Yeah. Um, and going back to what you were saying, Alex, I didn't know that about what you did with Rising Tide Capital. Um, and my college advisor used to have this big framed poster behind his desk that said, imagine what we could accomplish if we didn't care about who got the credit. Um, I'm also glad that you mentioned Brian Stevenson. He's probably one of my all-time favorite heroes. Um, and he is one of the people who inspired me to run for public office in the past. Um, I did that in Silicon Valley um, in a place where I thought that when young people wanted to make change, they only thought about entrepreneurship and starting startups. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you mentioned that business is not necessarily the, the destination, but do you feel that a politics of love or government has a role to play in in reaching um, that upper right quadrant you mentioned? It, the, there was a book that came out a few years ago called Winners Take All. Mm -hmm. um, that was a very difficult read, uh, I think for anyone that uh, has uh, 
participated in the modern social entrepreneurship field. Um, Rising Tide Capital wasn't mentioned in it, but we certainly could have been by virtue of uh, the, uh, the funders, uh, the philanthropic institutions that this book uh, lifted up. It was essentially talking about the ways in which uh, philanthropy has been used by capitalism to subvert social justice by co-opting the movement and that uh, by virtue of directing the allocation of resources, uh, direct it to very specific solutions, very specific kinds of messages, ones that uh, don't uh, threaten any kind of status quo, uh, that in some ways there's a pursuit of good, but it is more about what's left out and what is silenced and what isn't funded. Um, and uh, that was a, a, an important uh, critique and an important thing to lift up. But the part of that book that really hit very close to home, um, I think for me, in growing up, uh, I was born in 1981, so uh, in the, the, the cultural climate of the uh, Reagan years of America and in the years that followed, um, there has been, in, in an almost, it's not surreptitious, but it has, it has really become a subconscious acceptance of the idea that government is fundamentally a broken concept, or that it can't actually function, that it has to be, you know, in the old quote, that you have to shrink it small enough so you could drown it in a bathtub. Um, and, you know, when you go to a DMV, and you have an experience at various kinds of agencies, and, and certainly for many of the communities that we work with, the experience, the dehumanized and dehumanizing experience of engaging with institutions as we know them, there's a lot of reason why these things, why these ideas can actually pick up a lot of steam. And at the same time, democracy. <laughs> I mean, the, the critique of this book is to say that somehow, some way, um, by errors of omission at a minimum, the social justice movements and the social entrepreneurship movements of the past 20 or 30 years have essentially accepted the idea that government is not part of the playing field. And uh, its argument was to say that if we really want to pursue a bold and positive vision of what the future of this country can be, um, we need to reinvest in what it means to connect, especially at the local level, with government agencies and with government itself. We need to be involved in government, we need to coordinate our, uh, with government, we need to connect the services and solutions that we pursue with the functioning of government. And I thought that was a really compelling and convicting uh, proposal because it, it, it truly had been not something that had incorporated into our thoughts for a long time. And that, I think, haunts me and is a spur to thinking about how do we, again, to the concept of resilience, the freedom that we need, the creativity that comes from that freedom and the coordination that is a legitimate and important part of collective life. Um, is in some way enshrined in the pattern of coordination that democracy represents. And that has to be at the core of our thinking for the future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I was a government major. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, th I definitely think a lot about the role of government and uh, and even you know in co-founding Rising Tide, uh, there's a key person here, Douglas Forrester, who's sitting in the audience and at the time was in business but had been in state government. And I for sure uh, recall his words that if we if good people don't get involved in government and politics, then we have ceded the territory to those who will wield the powers of government to do the kinds of things that bring us true despair. Um, and so 
I am, I've always been very grateful for that and for the sacrifices he made uh, to, uh, to, pursue, um, to pursue politics and uh, to you and to our entrepreneurs. Because my reason for engaging with them, even though my main animating concern is around governance and issues of democracy and freedom and how to not have anybody need as I did as a little kid, you know, spend nights in jail with my grandmother because she's trying to protect her children from, um, you know, those who are wielding the powers of government in really powerful and terrible ways. Um, what I noticed was the role of local entrepreneurs as civic participants and leaders, that the kinds of entrepreneurs we're talking about building community with uh, they often, that same courage that allows someone to think they can start a business in a local community when they don't have two pennies to rub together often, um, that personality ends up being willing to print flyers and to knock on doors and to run for office. In fact, uh, one of our entrepreneurs, uh, Angela McKnight, who started a business uh, running an elder care business, inspired by the personal assistance needs of uh, her grandmother and then their friends. And then she came to formalize it with us. And, uh, and then we were writing stories about her business. And she got a call from uh, the local political leaders to say, oh, clearly you must be planning to run for office. I mean, you're doing all these wonderful things with elders. Uh, and the assumption was that she would run for office and get all these votes. And she was so confused. She called and said, I think they're asking me to run. Like, what, what does this mean? And was like, go for it, please. And it's, she's an amazing leader, uh, and she's taken all of her understandings of how her local economy works and what the role of individuals and businesses is into the ways that she is, participates in governance. And it is an enlightened way, and it is a grounded way, and she's using all of her skills and capacities uh, that makes her an excellent local entrepreneur to be an incredible leader. And that is really the vision, is that we can reanimate the interests of those who are in community with one another. And the concerns around economics are very closely linked with our politics. And as soon as you start engaging in your local economy, you begin to ask a lot of questions about how your government is working or why it's not working. Uh, why it has unrealistic expectations, or who is pulling the levers, because government really sets the conditions. A lot of what we're talking about in terms of a vision or a story, that is an intervention at a level of conditions. What our minds can imagine, it's about the conditions. What government does is very much about the conditions. And so, yes, it is profoundly important and something that we must engage with directly and indirectly. Yeah, and I totally agree that once you're in the mix and you see the details and you get proximate, then you can be a, b a better leader later. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and this is our last index card. So um, could you kindly speak to the global operating system of capitalism with relation to the greatest migration? Can this happen within the system? Um, I think it says, you say, lends to nihilism. Hmm. I can start and you can bring it home, but um, I think that in the land of disconnection and part of the dynamic that we have been engaging with in terms of the role of capital and what we observe with our entrepreneurs or the small businesses we advocate for, uh, and also just what we hear about and read about venture capital and what percentage of those resources go Forget local businesses, <laughs> just entire groups of humanity. Like 50% of the planet is made up of women, but venture capital only goes to 0.1%. I mean, pick your, you know. And so part of what we observe about the trajectory of capital is it continues to, uh, because what it measures and how it measures growth and success is on the basis of return on that capital. And because it is competing, and so if you're um, you know, a venture capitalist, then you're getting returns on your portfolio that are 10x 
uh, and I'm getting 40x and he's getting 400x, it's like, well, we want to be in his camp. And so it is disconnected, it's truly disconnected, and the feedback loops that are feeding it is pushing it further and further and further away into disconnection. And by that logic, it's looking at all of the world and its assets. And so in many ways, it's terrifying because it can look at a disaster like Maui and see tremendous opportunity to just get that land. <laughs> and whomever can make it there fast, that is so return because at the end of the day, you can you know um, monetize that land differently and uh, with much higher rates of return for that capital. And so there is this disconnection that lends uh, itself readily to uh, accusations of nihilism or when particularly um, there aren't people who are engaged in this dialogue. And I have to say that I'm encouraged because I think there's a lot more pressure uh, to start responding to what, um, you know, what place-based investing or impact investing needs to look like. And so I think there is real debate and I think the people who are within the system in those large scale systems are in deep discouragement and in need of uh, what I see as resourcing uh, for their courage to keep asking the questions even though the system of global capitalism at the moment is, um, it is a system. So it operates on feedback loops. And I think it requires um, all of us to engage with it and those who are holding capital uh, to recognize that there need to be additional, additional metrics for what is actually prudent in the investment decisions that they're making. Um. The, the, it was very interesting to re-engage through page by page, small is beautiful, in preparation for, uh, for our time together this afternoon. And it, we've been talking about this for years in, in, in terms of it's not just a glorification of the small, and that was not Schumacher's position either. It's not a simplistic, just focus on small and micro and local. We do need to think of this in the concept of, of living bodies, the circulatory system of bodies that have arteries and veins and capillaries. This is in some ways a structure of health. And so there is nothing fundamentally wrong with very, very large arteries of capital and other kinds of movement. If the ecosystem is in balance, uh, that is the question. So uh, when it comes to a critique of global capitalism, there are many different angles to take and very many to pursue. Um, there is greed, there is evil in the world, but, but the most pernicious evil is the banality of evil. It is the everyday thoughtlessness of systems and institutions that destroy life and dehumanize people and negate the world into meaninglessness. Um, purely out of thoughtlessness, purely out of not even a regard or an awareness that this is a consequence and that obviously brings in externalities as well. Um, and I don't know about anyone in this room, but if you've ever tried to stop a bad habit, it is a very hard thing to do to just say, I'm not going to eat that chocolate. <laughs> I'm going to uh, prohibit myself from these things. The much easier way that flows with human psychology is to move in the direction of the positive thing that you want to do. And so in the context of the greatest migration and in the context of what we've been talking about this afternoon, I think what matters is, is that the land of disconnection, the land where all the capital is located, is not a happy place by and large. People are terrified, as Alpha described, of falling into the land of abandonment. And it is also a land of disconnection from purpose, from the deepest parts of life. And the money and the other things, it just doesn't fill. It is, it's empty calories. So it's, it is 
what that indicates is that there is a opportunity, you could use market, there's a market opportunity. <laughs> How do you enable capital to be unlocked, to flow, the multiple kinds of capital that we've talked about, to flow in the directionality of flourishing? Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in connecting this, I think, to um, the work of the Schumacher Center, and one of the areas that I have always been very passionate about is the issue of currency. Because I think that at, at a base level, one of the biggest problems that we have in our economic system is a problem not of monopoly, but of monopsony, which is a very weird word. But monopsony is, um, it's a situation where there's only one buyer. I think we live in a world of monopsony, where we have a measurement system of currency that allows for only one ring to rule them all, one type of value. And the, per, the endeavors that we launch that are philanthropic or community oriented, um, that would uh, seek a sustainable business model but not seek to maximize uh, return on investment. The efficient flow of capital folks out there are saying, look, this is just not an efficient, let's just make the profit and we'll give it back to you. But of course that means the plants don't grow. We need a structure, an information architecture, and, and I, I believe when it comes to currencies that, that some of this needs to be actually enshrined into uh, government itself uh, in terms of the, the genius of American democracy was to split power into three branches. Why doesn't money have branches? Why isn't there a branch of money that can capture and enable us to manipulate value that can flow into ecological purposes and social purposes as well as value creation purposes? Value creation isn't a negative thing, but if it's the only game in town and every other way of pursuing anything has to go up in competition and be a distortion of market signals in some of the economic you know, critiques of you know, the, the, purpose, the social purpose of businesses is to make a, a profit because you're distorting the market by, by inadvertently and artificially uh, forcing it to do these things. In some ways, there's a legitimacy to that point, but if you go home and play a board game this weekend with your family, how many board games have multiple types of currencies that you use, where this type of currency is for this, and this type of currency is for this? I think uh, that there is something that's required to enable us to create measurement systems that can actually properly value and engage with the creation of ecological and social good in the world. Um, and I, I do think that at, at some point we will be probably able to engage with connections between universal basic income uh, and uh, national public service, voluntary public service, ecological cores, community cores, and enabling what, what is really required for these things and for currencies to really take off is not only the ability to spend them in places, which is where a lot of the work has focused, but how to earn them. And if we can create those circuits in our local communities, I think we can tap into that universal desire from all the lands to move in a different way and to live in a different way. And, and it's just latent, untapped potential. That was great. I'd be very excited to see how that idea develops and gets implemented over time. Um, thank you so much for your preparation, for being an example, for your thoughtfulness. Um, I welcome everyone to mingle with us over, over there, and thank you so much. We all really thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you.